text for the message this day from the first reading, Acts chapter 17. In Jesus' name, amen. Very religious, St. Paul says. Literally, the Greek words mean unusually devoted to divinities. St. Paul enters Athens and sees a city filled with idols. Other ancient writers note the same thing. Petronius, a Roman official during Nero's reign, Petronius was known for his satire, remarks that in Athens it was easier to find a god than a man. That's, that's a lot of gods, a lot of idols. Every public building was also a sanctuary dedicated to one or more gods. There were 3,000 public statues of gods, countless more in private homes, and every gateway and porch had its own protecting god idol. Paul begins in Athens the same way he always did. He speaks first in the Jewish synagogue, and then he also speaks in the agora, the marketplace. That's agora, that's the word where we get agoraphobia, you know, fear of public places, fear of being in crowded places. The agora, we don't have that problem too much right now, but as they open up, we may be still fearful of being in crowded places. Well, this is where that word comes from. The agora was not just a place of buying and selling, and think in your mind of some of the Middle Eastern marketplaces you may have seen on movies or TV that are just jam-packed, crowded with people. Not just a place of buying and selling, but it was also the meeting place of philosophers and their followers, and of people just looking for something to talk about. Paul had conversations there with Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Those were sort of the two leading schools of thought at that time. So Epicureans. Now notice some similarities with the modern theory of evolution. They believed, the Epicureans, believed the world was not created, but formed by a chance joining of atoms, very much like the theory of evolution. They had minor beliefs in gods, but they were more so just phantoms that really didn't influence anybody's life. They had a materialistic view of the soul. At death, it was just ended forever. The highest goal of life for an Epicurean was gratification. That sounds very modern, doesn't it? Pleasure, not duty, was the main idea of this philosophy. Stoics, on the other hand, were pantheists. That means they believed that God, there was a God that was the spirit of reason in all things. Kind of very much a Hindu idea in a sense. God was the spirit of reason in all things throughout the universe. Therefore, idols and temples weren't necessary for them. The soul, they thought, was physical. At death, it was absorbed into the God that was in all things. They had a higher moral code than the Epicureans. For the Stoics, reason was the guide of what was good and evil. It was a philosophy of human pride. Now, both of these philosophies opposed Christian doctrines of God, soul, sin, redemption, salvation in Christ, resurrection of the body, and eternal life. Not much left, is there? <laughs> Some of the people in the Agora ridiculed Paul as a, quote, babbler in our translation. Uh, the words literally mean seed picker. And I'm not sure what exactly that means. If it re would refer in our terms to somebody who's a nitpicker, you know, just every little thing. Or maybe it was their version of redneck. I don't know. <laughs> but it was, it, was a, it was a cut, you know, when they called him that. Others did seem interested in his message of what they called a foreign god, meaning one they didn't know about. So they invited him to speak before an informal meeting of their ruling council. That wasn't unusual because the greatest pastime in Athens was not the Olympic Games. It was speaking about and listening to new ideas. What we have here in Acts 17 has been called by some 
the greatest sermon or one of the greatest sermons ever preached, particularly to educated believers. Paul is very careful in his wording. He calls these people very religious, particularly devoted or unusually devoted to divinities. Now, Paul always began remarks before Greek and Roman audiences, starting out with words of respect and graciousness. Maybe we should learn from that. So he compliments them on their outward concern for religion. And as he visited there, looking at all their temples and altars and statues, he says he found one that was engraved with the words in Greek, agnosto theo, to the unknown God. Paul takes this to mean that in spite of their devotion to so many deities, there is one God that exists whom, while they know of him, they don't really know him. So Paul says he's going to tell them about that God. Paul starts with what we would call natural theology, calling their attention to what they see and experience in the world around them. He uses ideas from Holy Scripture, but he doesn't quote it. That wouldn't have been of any importance to them. They wouldn't have given any credence to his sacred writings, the Old Testament. He declares who God is, and he speaks about man's relation to God in terms of what they know in the world. Paul tells them that this unknown God is the one who made the world. Well, that disagreed with the Epicureans. You know, they thought it just all came together by itself. Paul says God doesn't dwell in handmade sanctuaries. That appealed to both of these groups, Epicurean and Stoic. Paul said God doesn't need anything from man. That agreed with the Stoics. And then Paul said that God is the giver of all. Life, breath, all things. And that disagreed with the Stoic teaching. And then Paul moves to the intentions of God regarding men, people. He says, from one man, or literally one blood, he made all the nations. God's hand is on all history, Paul says, the times and the boundaries of people's lives. God's supreme purpose for people is for them to be seeking God. Well, that implies that man had lost God even though Paul says that God is never very far from us. And Paul shows this connection by quoting their own Greek poetry, showing that he knows their classical literature and teaching. He's no uneducated hick that they can simply laugh away. And now comes the first really difficult part. Paul says the offspring of God ought to realize that divine nature could never be represented by anything made of precious metals or stone or anything else that's shaped by human ideas and human hands. Well, their city was full of those things. Paul is saying that is too low a conception of the divine. It's no wonder that both of these philosophers groups downplayed the importance of statues and altars. Dr. Lenski writes in his commentary, Paul shows them what to put in the place of all these gods, the infinite greatness, power, and glory of the one true God who is revealed already in the cosmos of his creation and in man, his offspring. One God, Paul says, one human race, and now Paul is going to proclaim one judgment and one way of salvation. He says that God overlooked the ignorance of the ages. The ignorance of the ages. Those are pretty striking words in what claimed to be the center of wisdom in the ancient world, Athens. But Paul says now is the time for them to repent of that kind of ignorance because God appointed a day of judgment. Judgment by the man he ordained. The evidence that God has chosen this man as judge is seen in God raising him from the dead. Talking about Jesus Christ. Now some of the people, maybe more than just some, 
mocked when the idea of resurrection was mentioned because that went against every kind of Greek philosophy. Even those who believed that some sort of a spirit of each individual lived on after death never, never thought of a physical resurrection. But there were others in the audience who still wanted to know more. Some of them, Luke tells us in the book of Acts, some of them believed. They were drawn close to Paul. Literally, the words mean glued to him. One of them named was Dionysius the Areopagite. That last word indicates he was part of the city leaders and rulers. The Areopagus was the, that high place that you see on pictures of Athens where it had that kind of plateau with the, the big temple up on top. That was their city hall, in a sense, and the headquarters of the city. He was one of those people. It indicates that he was part of their high council. Also named as a woman, Damaris, likely a person of importance in the city as well for her to be named here. And there were others too. A congregation began in spite of such overwhelming pagan surroundings. Christian writers in the second century AD tell us that Dionysius became the first bishop of Athens and was later martyred, put to death for his faith. A number of great minds of the early church would come out of this place from Athens. And eventually, all those thousands of Greek gods were abandoned. The Greek church stood strongly opposed to all those idols. That was part of the reason for the split between the Eastern and Western church a thousand years later. Let's consider how Paul's sermon applies today. One God versus the myriad gods of today. Some call our culture very religious or very spiritual. Some say not. <laughs> our nation does include thousands of religions. And besides the beliefs that are called religions, in our Lutheran understanding, we include everything that, must, that can take priority away from the one true God. The idols of today, money, <coughs> fame, power, sports, drugs, pleasure, possessions, all the things that can distract us and become central in our life instead of the one true God. So one God versus the myriad of gods. One God versus the philosophies of today. There are modern Epicureans who live only in pursuit of pleasure. And there are modern Stoics who cling only to reason and not faith. One humanity versus the attitudes of superiority and prejudice that abound in our world, the things that lead to countless wars and other oppression. One group of humans versus the self-centered attitude of our culture, this whole me-first mindset that causes us to be divided from one another. <clears throat> And I, I would guess that in today's setting in our country, the me first thing, even though we, we, we are concerned for everybody else, there's an awful lot of me first. And it can apply in one situation where people don't want to have anything to do with others because they want me first. It can apply, on the other hand, to people that want to be out with everybody because it's me first and they don't care about everybody else. Me first can infect both sides of that whole question. One plan of salvation versus something that's very common today, the, the idea that every path to God is equally valid. One plan of salvation versus another which is do-it-yourself religion, where everyone works his way to heaven, following whatever rules they choose and by being good enough. <clears throat> One judge, true man and true God, Jesus. One judge, given God's stamp of approval in the, in the resurrection, according to St. Paul. This judge lived perfectly in our weakness, this judge died in place of our failings. 
This judge arose in the face of death, our fiercest foe, and gives that to us. This risen Lord and judge is one who loves us. This Jesus is salvation. He's salvation for those who heard Paul in ancient Athens and believe. He is salvation for us today. And he desires to be salvation for the whole world. One God, one humanity, one plan of salvation, one judge, one risen Lord and Savior. Thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Hallelujah.